three, two, one. Ah, hi, how are you? It is one o'clock. It's Monday. So uh, it is time for, uh, it's time for um, Berkei Avot History and Hashkafa. Brought to you by, sponsored by Tel Aviv International Synagogue under the inspired leadership of Rabbi Ariel Constantine. And I have an announcement. And the announcement is that uh, this coming Shabbat, the 25th, 4th, and 25th of December, um, Parshat Shmot, I will be uh, substituting for Rabbi Constantine at the synagogue uh, in Tel Aviv on Rechov Frischmann. And I, uh, well, people should go to show. I think people should go to show anyways. But um, if you'd like to uh, come by and say hi, please do. Um, tefillah is at, uh, I think, 420, uh, followed by Champagne Kiddush. And then... Um, in the morning, we have uh, we have a hot kiddush, and I'll be speaking Shabbat afternoon between Mincha and Arvit. And uh, please come by. Um, I think it'll be fun. So that is um, that's my uh, that's my announcement. I do have uh, one thing I'd like to share with you. I don't think I'm going to do this, but <laughs> I'm actually thinking about it. It's so uh, so let me let me know when you read the uh, when you see this. If you want to write a comment, what do you think? I was actually thinking of, you know, there's an American um, weird custom that on um, the eve of, um, of a Christ on Christmas Eve, the Jews do two things. So they eat Chinese food and they go to the movies. So obviously this year there's no going to the movies. And in Israel there's generally no Christmas either. But um, go to the movies. Uh, um, we can't. It's Shabbat. But um, I understand that you can order from uh, Homasine to the... Um, supposedly one of the best Chinese restaurants, if not the only Chinese restaurant in Israel, um, take out for Shabbos. So I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Those of you who are interested might uh, might want to look up the uh, possibility. I did get it. I did get an ad for uh, somebody in Jerusalem was doing that, but I'm not schlepping food all the way from one place to the other. All right, enough. <laughs> enough for silliness. Um, the, um, in fact, that might be one of the things I might talk about on Shabbat is the history of the of Jewish uh, practices on uh, on Christmas Eve. There are a lot of, uh, super, not superstitions, a lot of um, fake news about why, what you do on Christmas Eve and why you do it. And maybe we'll have a small discussion of that. Okay, we were in the middle of um, conflating the descriptions of given by Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai of his various students and their... Um, in their obiter dicta. Um, the, um, okay, please excuse me. Uh, last week, my phone uh, went under. Uh, now it seems that the, uh, that the, um, the shul thing has uh, collapsed, so I'm going to start again. Just give me a second. Three, one. Hi, so we're back. All right, so um, we are now. Uh, when we're back, we're back to um, we're back to where we uh, um, we're back to where we were. All right, so we were discussing the um, as I said, conflating the stories of uh, and the information that we have about the students of Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai and their. Um, favorite sayings, to see if we can get an insight into their personalities, to see if it all sort of hangs to, uh, together. So let me remind you that um, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai had five students, or five key disciples. Only two of them really, or of any, uh, made a large, long-term mark on uh, on Judaism. The first, Rabbi Lezer ben Horkin, as we spoke about at length. Uh, the second one, who we're going to discuss today, is um, Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananya. Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananya uh, really is the polar opposite in many, many ways, of Rebbe Lezer. On the one hand, if Rebbe Lezer came from wealth, uh, Rebbe Yoshua ben Hananya, who came from the town of Bikiyin in the uh, in the Galilee, um, was a uh, from a, was a was from a working class or worse family. He was a blacksmith apparently by trade, so tradition would have it. Um, I would mention that the town of Bikiyin in the Galil, in the center central Galil is, according to tradition, the one place in the land of Israel where Jews have always lived. Never left. Uh, the, uh, there is one family, the Zinati family, 
which uh, claims uh, uninterrupted residence in Bikian, uh from the time of uh, the Second Temple and before. Uh, according to tradition, the synagogue in Pekin is made up with, is first of all, is the Beit Midrash, the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Shubin Hananya in, in Talmudic times, and was made, included stones from the temple. Of course, today there's something of a problem, uh, nothing of a problem. The, um, the one person, the one member of the family who survived, who really never left Pekin, Mrs. Margalit, Miss, I should say, Miss Margalit Sinati, um, never married. She has no children. So um, she should be 120. Uh, by her counts, um, by her counts, that will bring the tradition to an end. She has a cousin, however. The cousin, who is also a Zinati, apparently moved away to, uh, this is the way she told me, uh, moved away to Tveria for a while and then came back. But as far as she's concerned, that broke the chain. And the fact that he's there uh, and uh, doesn't, doesn't count, then she's the last of the Mohicans, and that's what she claims. Okay, either way. Uh, so, but there were other Jews who lived there. It's a mixed uh, village, mostly Drew, Druze and, um, and Jews. And uh, I highly recommend that you visit when you're in the Galil, in any of it. So Rabbi Yeshua is really from the other side of tracks. Uh, in addition, he, um, uh, despite, it's interesting, I don't know if this goes together or not, but he was also something of a, um, he was, I don't say more liberal, he was more expansive as an interpreter of Torah, if uh, as we talked about the fact that that Rabbi Yeshua, uh, that sorry, Rabbi Leizer was more conservative, he never said anything that he didn't hear from his teacher. Um, uh, Rabbi Yeshua is far more willing to um, to take uh, to be a little bit more daring, more innovative in his ter- interpretation of the Torah. It doesn't mean he didn't stick to the rules. Of course, he stuck to the rules, but he um, he shows a bit, uh, a lot more. I shouldn't say not just a bit more. A lot more intellectual uh, daring, and it's to him, and he is the one in the famous encounter in in that in the oven of Achnai that when a heavenly voice comes out and says, uh, "Why are you bothering Beliezer? We agree." Uh, the law is always in accordance with his opinion. So Yeshua gets on his feet and said, uh, "Excuse me, Lo he, You gave us the Torah, God, and now you gave us the authority to interpret it as we wish, and that's it. No, you know, um, no, uh, no, no, ta- no, no taking back." Uh, which is a very gutsy thing to do, especially for a person who came from no, you know, as it were, no yichas. In any event, so so you have really, it's, and they locked horns on many occasions, uh, Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua, later on, uh, Rabbi Yeshua, later on, Rabbi Yeshua locks horns with Rabbi Gamliel, the uh, head of the um, of the Sanhedrin, uh, he, and on a number of occasions, um, Rabbi Gamliel uh, humiliates um, Rabbi Yeshua, which in the end leads to uh, the deposing of Rabbi Gamliel for a period of time. Uh, he, so he's a very complicated person. He's not, in other words, he doesn't, he's just because he came from uh, modest circumstances didn't mean that he um, was shy and didn't mean that he, you know, hid his opinion on the contrary. He's, he's, when, thing, when a matter of principle was at, he was, when a matter of principle was at, was at stake, he was more than willing to stand up for his uh, for his principles, and that's uh, that's not a small that's not a small thing. If you're, uh, you know, if you don't come from uh, money and you don't come from uh, from yichas, to uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, take on the big boys. That's that's quite something. Uh, nevertheless, um, that's what Rabbi Yeshua did. So let's see how he's characterized, what he um, what he um, what he said, and try to put it all together. So when um, Rabbi Yochum ben Zakkai uh, tries to characterize or to say something nice about his various uh, students, so when it comes to Rabbi Shubin Hananya, he says, this is uh, chapter 2, Mishnah 8, he says, Rabbi Yochum ben Hananya, Ashrei Yolaito, happy is the woman who gave birth to him. Now that's kind of anodyne. It's, that's not a, you know, it's like, wow, huh? hello, what do you mean? So, so what? You can say, that's, there's nothing... See, when he talks about Elizabeth Horkinus, he says he's a guy with an incredible memory. He never misses anything. Later on in the same in the same Mishnah, he mentions his student, Rabbi Elizabeth Arach, who is apparently a wildly brilliant and creative individual. And he says he's like a he's like an ever-increasing, ever-sustaining a fountain. Happy is the woman give birth to him. No, okay. I mean, that's sort of like uh to whom it may concern. Um you know, it's like uh, I, I don't know when when I when I was uh, I won't say mention names, of course, 
when I was a young assistant rabbi somewhere, so the senior rabbi who I worked with um, used to sit uh, used to sit on Motzi Shabbos and he would write a eulogy and a something for a pigeon and Ben and for a bris. Uh, because he didn't know what was going to pop up during the week. Somebody might die, he has to have a eulogy ready. But there was like, you know, one size fits all. That's the same thing. Why, why, why dafka that? What, what is, what is, uh, what, what, why, why be so, I don't know, so general, so powerful about it? I, I think I'm, I have an idea. You, you probably won't be surprised. I will come back to it in a bit. And later on, um, Rabbi Yochum Zakai says to all the five students, all right, go out and see what kind of, uh, what kind of quality, what kind of, um, what kind of quality, what kind of, uh, what, how could you express the best way for a person to live his life? And everybody has a different, everybody has a different position. Interesting, interestingly, Rabbi Liezer says, um, Rabbi Liezer says, I and Tova and I and Ra, avoid a bad eye and, a, and, a, and an evil eye. Come back to that. And Rabbi Yeshua says, interestingly, Rabbi Yeshua says, no, chaver tov v'chaver ra. What, if you really want to live a good life, you want to live a proper life, you want to live a constructive life, you want to live a moral life, have, make good friends. And make sure that, the, and, be, and be discerning. Be careful about the friends that you make. Um, and make sure that they're uh, people of the kind of moral quality and my kind of character that, um, that reflect the kind of life you want to live. Okay. Now that's Mishnah number two. Mishnah number three. When we get to Mishnah number three is Mishnah eleven. Rabbi Yeshua Omer. Ayin. Now here we have an interesting question about what's the, what's the text. Ayin hara, the evil eye or an evil eye. Okay. Because it could be ya ayin ra or ayin hara. V'yetzer hara and the evil inclination. V'sinat habriot and hitting other people. Those things will actually, well, motzi et adam alam can mean two things also. It can mean will prevent him from having a place in society, will cause his death, it actually means three things, and could mean that he doesn't have a place in the next world. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's, what, um, that's what he says. So the question is, so there are a couple questions to be asked. First, we have to define the terms. What's a good friend that we've spoken about in the past? I, I don't think we have to go back to that. Um, um, Ma Maimonides, Rav Soloveitchik used to always say this. Rav Soloveitchik, Maimonides, when he talks about the importance of friendship, one of the things he says is maybe the most important thing is to be, a, you have to have a, have a person who will be there for you and so on. There obviously, there's always chemistry between friends. But the most important thing is you should have a chaver ledea, that really you should be friends on a very profound level. Not just uh, utilitarian, but that you share your outlook, share your values, uh, share a common language. Not, not. I don't mean in terms of lexical, again, in terms of linguistics. I mean that you understand each other. That's a good friend. Um, that's a real good friend. Chavera is the opposite. Right. Um, what's ayin hara? What's ayin hara? Well, is it ayin hara or is it ayin ra? Because the question is, that they, some 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 um, some manuscripts, the most actually the most authoritative manuscripts have the hay, and some and a lot don't. So what was he, what did he have in mind? So, um, if he mean if it's I and ra, a bad I, then that would mean that um, and that would fit it would apparently fit the uh, context. So Rabbi Shua says. If you want to get around along with people, you want to be involved in the world. Then first of all, you can't walk around and and just um, react negatively with jealousy, with bitterness, with with a jaundiced eye to what other people have. Similarly, when you interact with them. You shouldn't give in to your uh, being overly uh, cupidness. You shouldn't uh, give in to your dark side. You should act like a mensch. You should act like a person. You should you should relate to not every single person. I've said this more than once. Relate to every single person as a cell of Elohim, as a person who was created in the image of God. So in other words, I and Ra, if that's like, if that's what it means, 
would mean that the, when you look, the way that you look at the world should be with generosity, with um, empathy, with positivity. And when you interact with people, you should uh, not give in to your baser instincts, but rather, um, but rather act uh, according to your um, your good inclinations. And the you know, thing, thing is proper, and that requires a lot of work, always. I mean, we all be it's a hard, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, in fact, it can be possibly it can be one's evil inclination, as it were, one's drives if they're properly uh, channeled, are a positive good. Um, but um, but still, um, but still, it's clear if, if, if along this line of argument, it would seem that Rabbi Yeshua is um, is talking about how people should get along with each other. Don't hate other people, because if you do all those things together and you don't, you know, give into your day based aside, and you're always looking at a jaundiced eye at other people, and you and you and you're always thinking just about me, and 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 you're giving you into your evil inclination, and you walk around. And bitter and 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 hateful with regard to other people, then you're not going to you're not going to get along with anyone. Oh, if that's the way you read it, then what he said before makes all the sense. And in fact, what Rabbi Chanan Zakai said uh, said all the it made all the sense. It all comes together in one package. What had what had um, what had um, Rabbi Shmuel Ben Chanan just said? He said, "What should you look What should you look for in life?" He said, "A good friend." What should you avoid? A bad friend. In other words, you need to get along with people. Now, the way to do that is, and not to give it to your baser side, is to, in fact, find good people and not bad people. I mean, that's that's a, that's a given, right? So it so it it's all along the same line. All it's all along the same line. And finally, we get back to Rabbi Yochanan Zaka, who said, "Happy is the mother who gave birth to such a kid because what's the high? Uh, yes, I know." We, you, you, you want the kid to be, you want your children to be successful, and you want them to be doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs and all sorts of very nice. But at the end of the day, you want to be a mensch. If you could, if we can, if we can succeed at raising people that are mentioned, then that's an amazing, uh, that's an amazing compliment. So I suggest if you put all three Mishnayot together, you understand what what Rabbi Yochanan was like. I was saying because he is he, he saw in Rabbi Yeshua. This uh, this positive uh, this positive quality of just acting like a mensch, but working on it, but working on it, and you can't do it alone. You need to do it when you survive, but surrounded by good people. Choice of choice of one's society, choice of one's community is very very critical. All right, that's so that's one line of interpretation. The problem is, and it's what I'm about to say is not all that different than than than. Um, the one I've set up till now, most manuscripts say that it doesn't say ayin ra, but it says ayin hara. <laughs> ayin hara. Or in Yiddish, ayin hara, the evil eye. So if that's the case, what Rabbi Yeshua is, has said is as the evil eye and the evil inclination, and hating one's fellow person removes one's, removes oneself from the uh, from the world. So, let's talk a little bit about Ayin Hara. Um, the belief in Ayin Hara is um, very very common. Uh, it is not originally a Jewish belief. It is a folk belief. It's attested to way before, way before Abraham in Ugarit already. Way, way before, yeah, I'm saying that. Uh, yeah, you in Ugarit and before and in Ur, there are um, there's references not only to the evil eye but to all kinds of ways of um, all kinds of ways of uh, avoiding uh, the evil uh, the evil eye. The eye, evil eye. Um, is a belief that people have the capacity, if you look at a person um, sideways, if you look at a person with uh, malevolence, you look at a person with hatred, that, that, you, that, that people have the capacity of actually cursing them, of actually hurting them. And um, it's something you can't see. It's something you'll never know if it's happening. 
Um, but it's uh, but the belief is very ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. It's extremely common, extremely common in the Middle East. Although it, you find it in other cultures as well. Um, interestingly, the rabbis themselves. Oh, I was always mentioning in passing. The um, you know we even today we don't we're not into uh, Ayin Hara, but the truth is. Um, the idea of uh, the idea of Ayin Hara of avoidance of these sort of supernatural um, uh, malevolent forces that can hurt us and hurt our children or whatever still very much there. We still say in he in Yiddish you say Ken Ayin Hara. It comes off as Kenahara. Nobody knows what that is, but it's Ken Ayin Hara without the Ayin Hara. I like you, as if when you say if you see a little kid and they're so and they're so good looking and they're so smart, you say Ken Ayin Hara. Because you don't, you want to protect them from the evil eye. Somebody will look at this kid and say, "Look at it, si- look at the kid sideways," and curse them. In Hebrew, you say "bliay and hara." More ubiquitous in uh, in Israel is uh, the chamsa. What's the chamsa? The chamsa is five fingers, okay, hand. Usually, there's an eye in the middle, and it's like stop, stop. That's how you protect yourself from the evil eye. It's one of the most uh, pot, well, the evil, the chamsa is one of the chamsa means five in Arabic, uh, is one of the you know mo- most popular uh, a- articles of jewelry in uh, in the uh, not jewelry 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 that you can get and get with the big ones and little ones with so stones and whatever. Um, and in addition, even if you don't have one around, if you want to uh, prevent the evil eye, you people spit between their fingers, or you say chamsa chamsa chamsa. Kilo, um, stop. Don't, you know, don't, don't, stop it. Oh, evil eye, stop. Um, interestingly, uh, Professor Zip Safrai, in his commentary on Avot, mentions that um, originally Chazal were, uh, the rabbis in the Talmud, were very, very, very wary. They didn't like uh, superstition. You can be uh, sure, of course, that Maimonides, of course, has no truck with this, uh, with this kind of stuff uh, at all. Um, and, um, he, uh, he basically, uh, you know, he says no such thing. And the rabbis themselves apparently were not really into, uh, they would, they didn't believe in it. They would, they fought against it. So when Rabbi Yeshua here is saying, ayin hara, he doesn't mean using the ayin hara. He's saying, if you think that you can hurt other people, but if, you, if you're going to organize your life around being afraid of somebody else's ayin hara, then you're going to, you know, forget it. Um, that's not uh it's 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 not real don't don't go there um and um and and that's uh and that's very much um and if that's the case it means then the the mission would go i and hara meaning it, the very giving any credence to the belief of the evil eye and giving into your own Yetzirah, when one might be connected to the two, and hating other people because you're going to try to think you can do all kinds of stuff to other people that's going that's going to destroy your place in society um, an interesting thing happened over time that the belief in Ahayin Hara uh, went from being a popular um, superstition to actually being taken somewhat seriously by the rabbis in the later parts of the time of the Talmud and also in lots of parts of the Jewish diaspora, both Ashkenazic and Sephardic, uh, in, to the degree even that... Um, that concern with an ayin hara uh, affects certain uh, certain ritual practices and certain halachot. For example, there is a um, there is a there is an accepted rule that if you're if you are the uh, gabai of the shul and you're calling people up to have a liot to the Torah, then you don't call two brothers one after the other, and you don't call a father after a son or a son after a father. Why? Ayin hara. Ayin hara. How it works with the Ayin Hara, I don't know. That's not my not my not, not my not my strong suit. But it is a uh, but it but that's that's the given reason. Um, interestingly, however, um, even though there were rabbis who uh, who did accept this, and there are uh, as I said rules that, that are based on the belief in the Ayin Hara, uh, there's a constant throughout the ages from the early Middle Ages onward, tremendous constant pushback. To say, nah, it's nothing to it. Please leave me alone. So I'll give you uh, I'll give you two examples. 
So I mentioned a few times, um, a few times, to- I mentioned to you first time the names of Rabbi Matityahu Yitzhari. Rabbi Matityahu Yitzhari lived in late 14th, early 15th century Spain. He was a major intellectual. He participated in defending the Talmud at the at Tortosa in the early 15th century. So in um, so when it comes to I, I, so in describing Ayin Hara, he says, He says, there's no such, implicitly, there's no such thing as Ayin Hara as a supernatural thing. Person is a jaundiced attitude, and he can't stand that anybody else is happy, and therefore he will work over time to make sure that they're, they're unhappy. I mean, what was it? It's like... Um, uh, H.L. Mencken had a famous uh, de- definition of a Puritan. A Puritan is a person who can't sleep because somewhere, somehow, someone is having a good time. Somebody's enjoying themselves. So that's it's so the same thing. So he says, he says, so you can't, I and Harad don't look and stare at what people have, don't really look at people who have, and don't, and, and, be, and if you sit there and stare and you get jealous and whatever, it's, it's, got, it's not going to end well. So that is, um, so, and consistently, if you go through the classic commentaries on, on, um, on Pirkei Avot, um, you get this, you know, you, you get this sense that they're constantly trying to let it block the uh, this uh, uh, ubiquitous belief in the in the evil eye. I wouldn't be surprised if the hay that I mentioned before somehow got lost because um, because the rabbis didn't want people believing the evil eye. That's you know, it just it, 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 went, it makes more sense that it went from ayin hara to ayin ra or ra to uh, than the other way around. Um, even when it comes to, interestingly, in the modern era, we have two major poskim, and with this we'll close today. Two major poskim. Plenty of people believe in Ayahara today. I mean, a lot of a lot of superstitions have made have made an incredible comeback in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, astrology and um, um, astrology and um, what should we say? Tea reading and uh, and coffee and coffee reading coffee grinds and phrenology and God knows what else. Um, Dafkin of twentieth century, two at least two of the leading halachic authorities, one Ashkenazi, one Sephardi, um, came out pretty four square against giving any um, giving any uh, credence to the idea of uh, of uh, of the Ayin Hara. So one of them is Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. Rav Moshe has a tshuva which he asks, he's asked about to what degree do we really have to be careful, really have to be concerned with, um, with, um, with Ayin Hara. So they want to give two brothers, one brother, uh, an aliyah after the other. So Rav Moshe said, look, at, it's not such a big deal. He said, look, at, you know what? He quotes a Gemara in Psachim, and he says, you know what? You know who you know who's affected by evil eye. People who believe in the evil eye. If you don't believe in the evil eye, it's not going to. It's not a function. It's not a. It doesn't fill any any. It doesn't fill any role whatsoever. So don't believe in the evil eye and give the aliyah and goodbye. So that's uh, that's his opinion. Rav Vadya, coming from a Mizrahi context, and it's really very interesting that he would say this, uh, as in, in a recorded um, in a recorded uh, lecture that he gave, a popular lecture he gave many years obviously many years ago. Excuse me gone a number of years, um, in the uh, Beit Knesset HaYazdim, in the uh, Yazdi uh, uh, Shul in, uh, in uh, near Meir Sharim, he, uh, he's, he's like said, who listens? He says, does anybody pay attention to the, uh, the evil lie today? It's ridiculous. Nobody should pay attention to the evil lie. Rabbis talked about it. Okay, but later. But he, and he, then he quotes the same thing the Rabbi Shah says. If you don't pay attention, if, it doesn't, if you don't worry about it, if it's not something that's on your agenda, so it's not going to hurt you. So leave it alone. And he just says, you know, like, he was very, I could be very emphatic. And he absolutely no truck whatsoever uh, with the evil eye, which is striking, which is striking. Um, I mean, listen, I would have expected, you know, those of us who consider ourselves greatly sophisticated, so, oh, we're very happy, and wh- why would we think otherwise? But it's striking that these two, uh, these two authorities, um, Dafka uh, decided to take up this issue at a time when, uh, in popular culture, um, things like witchcraft and all kinds of uh, superstitions have had uh, a resurgence. Now, why have uh, things like this had a resurgence in the from the late eighties onward? Uh, and what and why did New Age develop and stuff like that? That's not for now, especially since it's already one thirty. So we will see you uh, next week, and uh, same time, same place. And please, 
If you're in the area, if you're in Tel Aviv this Shabbat, please come to the please come and visit the uh, Tel Aviv International Synagogue on Frischman Street. It's right near the it's right near the water. Um, as, as Friday night we have, a, as I said, we have a champagne kiddush, uh, a hot chont kiddush after um, after uh, tefillah in the morning at eh, around quarter of eleven, eleven. I mean, you could come for davening too, but I know a lot of people in that area come JFK just for kiddush, and um, come over and say hi. And I uh, look forward to seeing you, and uh, we will see you next time. In the meantime, have a great week.